played the long game for the perfect revenge on my cheating wife and her app, and it ended just the way I wanted. If someone had told me that five years after high school graduation, my high school sweetheart would cheat on me or have another relationship while we were engaged, I would have thought they were joking. I financially supported her while she was searching for better opportunities. During high school, I was known for being focused, intelligent, caring, and highly active in various groups. When I finished high school, I was in excellent physical condition. The only sport I participated in was wrestling, which I enjoyed because it allowed me to eat freely, and I could easily burn off the calories during wrestling matches. Some might compare it to football, but football workouts have intervals and aren't as physically demanding as wrestling. Additionally, wrestling doesn't involve the head-on-head -head collisions that can destroy your brain. I was dating an attractive older girl from school who had graduated two years earlier and attended a university in another state. We maintained a long-distance relationship with the hope of me joining her at the same school after my graduation. We initially met at a friend's birthday party when we were both in other relationships. She arrived with her boyfriend, but that night, she went home with me and we slept together on the first night we met. She later convinced me to break up with my girlfriend for her. Although our connection wasn't strong, her physical attractiveness played a significant role in my decision. She assured me she would end her relationship with her boyfriend, which she eventually did. After graduating, I proposed to her, and we became engaged with the hope of getting married once we both completed our postgraduate degrees. I decided to enroll in the same university as her. She was pursuing a bachelor's degree in nursing, while I was on a pre-med track with the goal of obtaining a bachelor's degree in biology and then applying to medical school. During our college years, my fiancé and I rented an off-campus apartment near the university. Initially, we both worked part-time jobs while attending school. I had the advantage of a four-year academic scholarship, which covered most of our expenses, so the financial burden fell more on her. Our parents didn't come from affluent backgrounds and struggled to support themselves, so we were essentially on our own. Around her third year in school, she faced academic challenges. She had consistently been a B-minus student and was struggling to maintain her grades. To gain admission to the nursing program, she needed to improve her academic performance. She approached me, expressing her desire to work fewer hours and focus more on studying. She believed this would help her boost her grades. At that time, I thought about our relationship and my commitment to supporting her. I recognized that as fiancés, we should have each other's backs. I didn't want her to risk being dismissed from her nursing program due to poor grades. It was important to me that she could concentrate solely on her studies, as she was genuinely dedicated, but found it challenging to balance both work and school, unlike me. I was working long hours, sometimes up to 60 hours a week, to cover expenses like her health care, our rent, and utilities. My commitment to work and school took a toll on my health. Despite having a full academic scholarship, I still had to maintain a high GPA and a minimum credit hour load to stay in the program. My regular routines and discipline, which helped me maintain my excellent physical condition, fell by the wayside. I used to train with the college wrestling team for over two years to stay in shape. Wrestling didn't offer much of a future beyond the Olympics or MMA, which isn't financially rewarding unless you're at the very top. As I started picking up extra shifts to support my fiancé, I gradually began skipping wrestling practice and eventually stopped working out altogether. I continued to consume the same amount of calories as before, so it didn't take long for me to gain 70 to 80 pounds. As our relationship deteriorated, there were times when she would go missing and not answer my calls. Instead, I'd receive text messages and automated responses like I can't talk right now. I was so preoccupied with school and work that I didn't have the time to confront her. Looking back, there was an instance when I called her, and I heard a man's voice in the background, along with heavy breathing. When I asked her about it, she immediately hung up. I called her several times, and she didn't answer. When she finally called back, she claimed she was at the gym and some guy was bothering her. It was strange because I knew for a fact that she didn't go to the gym at the time I called, but I trusted her and didn't investigate further. Despite the additional responsibilities, I managed to graduate with my undergraduate degree a year ahead of schedule. However, she still had two more years to complete her nursing program. After obtaining my undergraduate degree, we decided that I would take the medical entrance exam but delay starting medical school until she finished her nursing degree. Her nursing program was nearly complete, and medical school is much more demanding. I couldn't handle working 60 plus hours and attending medical school simultaneously, and I wanted to avoid accumulating excessive student loans. Our plan was for me to support her financially by working while she finished her nursing program, and then she would, in turn, support me when I pursued medical school. This way, she could provide financial stability for our household while I attended med school, as there wouldn't be any financial support available for her if I started medical school right away. It seemed like a great idea at the time, but in hindsight, it was one of the worst mistakes I've ever made. There were several alternative paths I could have taken, such as encouraging her to take out more loans to support herself while I focused on my goal of becoming a doctor. Sacrificing my future for her seemed reasonable at the time, as waiting for her to complete nursing school and establish stability before I began medical school appeared to be a good plan. After all, I thought we would spend our lives together, 
So what was a mere two-year sacrifice for the love of my life? I still believed it was a solid plan because my fiancé wasn't just anyone, she was my fiancé, and we lived together, sharing everything. About six months after graduating, I was still working full-time at CVS Pharmacy, and she had about a year and a half left to become a nurse. Our relationship had changed significantly from how it used to be. I had suspicions that she might be cheating on me because she was lying about things she shouldn't be lying about, and the lies kept piling up. Despite this, I held on to hope that things would improve in the end. I was still determined to pursue my dream of becoming a doctor and was preparing for my medical school entrance exam. Meanwhile, I was stuck working as a pharmacy tech day in and day out, all while waiting for my fiancé to finish school, which would take another year and a half. The bond between us was no longer what it used to be. We found ourselves in frequent arguments, during which hurtful words were exchanged. She would call me immature and overweight, but I would remind her that without my financial support, she wouldn't have achieved what she had. We would threaten to leave each other, but I always ended up staying because I saw the potential of what we could become, not what we actually were. The reality was that she had changed from the girl I initially fell in love with. She made various excuses to avoid spending time with me, sometimes not coming home or answering calls, only responding through text messages. Occasionally, moments of clarity would remind me of my dreams, but my love for my fiancé always convinced me to continue doing it all for both of us. Looking back, I should have pursued my dreams independently, regardless of any relationship. About six months before her graduation, I remember suggesting the idea of having a baby, thinking it might revitalize our relationship and rekindle our love. However, she quickly dismissed the idea, stating that it wasn't the right time and we should wait until she graduates in six months. Three months before her nursing school graduation, I returned home from work one evening to find all her belongings gone. Initially, I thought we had been robbed, but it was peculiar because only her things were missing, the ones I had purchased for her. I tried calling her, but she didn't answer, instead, she sent me a text explaining that our relationship was over and where she had left the engagement ring. She informed me that she had moved on with her life and suggested I do the same. Her approach was cold and businesslike, devoid of any emotion or consideration for the years we had spent together, the support I had provided throughout her four years of schooling. There was no phone call, just a text message. I felt betrayed and humiliated. In my attempts to seek answers, I texted her, questioning how she could do this to me. I reminded her of the years I had sacrificed for her and demanded what I felt I was owed. I called her multiple times, but she refused to answer, eventually blocking my number. It felt like a devastating scam that had unfolded before my eyes. Throughout the relationship, I had thought of her as somewhat below average in intelligence, but I came to realize that intelligence has many layers. I began to feel as though she had manipulated and taken advantage of the love I had for her. In essence, our relationship seemed akin to one of those online catfishing scams, but it had played out in person over six to seven years. She used me to finance her education and then discarded me like garbage, leaving me utterly broken. If it weren't for her, I could have completed my four-year degree in under two years and been well on my way through medical school. Her actions left me deeply mistrustful and depressed, making it difficult to function normally or maintain my daily routine. Two days after she blocked my number, I decided to wait for her outside the hospital where she worked, hoping to confront her face to face. I sat in my car until she emerged from the building. As she headed toward a brand new BMW, I approached her. When she spotted me, she startled, rushed to her car without making eye contact, and swiftly sped away. I should have understood the message then, but I didn't. Regrettably, she had shattered me to the point where I developed the unhealthy habit of monitoring her activities, even though she wanted nothing to do with me. I began following her whenever I had free time, shadowing her movements without her awareness, and this continued for a few months. I couldn't comprehend why my fiancé of seven years had abruptly ended our relationship. She pulled the rug out from under me without my realization. At that time, I was convinced I could win her back, clinging to the belief that she was still mine, oblivious to the fact that she had long moved on gone even a year before officially ending things. Essentially, I had been providing financial support to maintain her lifestyle while she sought another potential partner. By the way, when I was secretly tailing her car and watching her without her knowledge, I didn't initially feel like I was doing anything wrong. In my mind, I needed answers and closure. Looking back, I'm not proud of that period in my life. Three days later, I found myself back at the hospital parking lot. I had returned to the very spot in front of the hospital where she worked, with the intention of confronting her once again. I waited inside my car, parked there for hours, well aware of her usual work hours, but sometimes she stayed longer than expected. Finally, she emerged from the hospital in her nursing attire and made her way to her new BMW. Initially, I had positioned my car close to the exit, planning to approach her quickly before she could retreat to her vehicle. However, as I opened my car door, I had a change of heart. Instead, I decided to discreetly observe her without her knowledge, hoping to learn more about her current living situation and the person who had bought her the car. I couldn't fathom that she could have purchased it herself, given our recent financial struggles. The car she now drove had been her dream car, she had often talked about it. 
I followed her for more than 45 minutes, heading far from the area I was familiar with, toward an upscale neighborhood. I maintained a few car lengths of distance, ensuring she wouldn't notice me tailing her. Eventually, she entered the driveway of a house with a four-car garage, and the garage door rolled open, concealing her car from view. I was taken aback. She must be living with a wealthy individual because there was no way she could afford this on her own. Even with her nursing degree, it would take years to attain such wealth. I believe there was more to this story, so I parked my car a few blocks away and waited. Another car approached the driveway, and one of the four garage doors swung open, allowing the car to enter. I couldn't see who it was, but my curiosity consumed me. I couldn't resist the urge to investigate further. It was growing dark, but I thought I might find a way to peer through a window. I stepped out of my car and approached the house. It was enclosed by a fence, and I circled the property, attempting to glimpse through a gap in the fence. That's when I noticed security cameras, surveilling the area. Realizing I was being watched, I turned around and left. I returned to my car and drove home. The following morning, I called in sick at work and returned early, hoping to tail the car that had entered the garage the previous day. The next morning, I returned early at around 6 a.m., aware that my ex fiancés shift began at 9 a.m. I was hoping the other car would still be there, so I could identify its owner. Upon my arrival, I couldn't be certain if the other car had departed, so I parked my car a few blocks away and waited eagerly, intent on discovering the identity of the person. Fortunately, the garage door eventually opened, and the car exited. I discreetly followed the car all the way to the same hospital. A man in his mid-thirties emerged from the car. He struck me as familiar, dressed in a suit. I decided to get out of my car and shadow him, curious to learn more about him. I observed him entering an elevator, destined for the third floor. Without being noticed, I sprinted up the stairs and managed to catch up with him. I recognized him as the doctor I had seen roughly a year ago on my ex fiancés Instagram. She had shown me group photos of her new work colleagues, as she was quite active on social media, unlike me. There was a post featuring him on her Instagram when she had started her clinicals. He was the doctor she had been working with extensively, and they had taken an innocent group picture with other nurses, which she had shared on Instagram. He entered his office and later emerged wearing doctor scrubs. I had no doubts at this point, he was indeed a doctor at the same hospital where my ex fiance was completing her clinicals. Since our initial meeting over a year ago, who knew how long they had been involved with each other? If I had Instagram, maybe I should have noticed something. I hesitated to download the social media platform now because I was afraid of what I might discover. Perhaps I should have taken this situation in stride and moved forward. A doctor took my girlfriend, and they might have been seeing each other for over a year while I was in a relationship with her. Lesson learned. Instead of waiting for me to become a doctor, she chose someone who was already a doctor, someone with money. I couldn't compete with that. I was overweight, broke, almost 25 years old, with a seemingly worthless bachelor's degree in biology. I was working as a tech at a local CVS pharmacy, my car barely worked, and I had spent all my savings on my fiancé before she left me for a doctor. Depression took a toll on me, and the breakup shattered me as a man. I had never felt a worse feeling in my life. During that time, I had no more dreams or ambitions, it was truly a tragedy. I couldn't even recognize myself anymore. In my free time, I found myself secretly following my ex-fiancé around. I followed them for reasons I can't quite explain, and this went on for several weeks. Looking back, the only reason I can give is that I was searching for closure, though I never attempted to confront them. Then, one day, I was so careless that I fell asleep in my car on the same street as their house. I was awakened by a knock on my window. It was my ex-fiancé's boyfriend, the doctor, with my ex-fiancé standing behind him. She had a phone camera recording the interaction. They wanted me to roll down my window. She was yelling at me hysterically, calling me a weirdo, and demanding that I stop following her and leave her alone. The one-sided confrontation lasted only about five minutes as I struggled with my keys to start my ignition. They were both yelling angrily at me, and I could barely make out their words. The doctor asked me what was wrong with me, saying they had noticed me following them for a while and had been documenting it. He threatened to issue a restraining order against me. From the way he was speaking, it was clear he thought I was just some guy obsessed with his brand new girlfriend and started following her. She must not have told him that we had dated for almost seven years and nearly got married. To make matters worse, I was trying to start my car, but it wouldn't cooperate, so I kept trying as they continued yelling at me. The only thing separating us was my driver's side window. They claimed they had seen me on their security camera and had been documenting me following them, intending to get a restraining order. It was the most embarrassing moment of my life. Fortunately, my car finally started after what felt like a thousand tries. I drove off feeling stupid and ashamed, seeing for the first time how pathetic my life had become. Two days later, a process server delivered a restraining order for my ex-fiancé and her current boyfriend. Reality began to sink in, and I realized I could end up in jail if I continued my previous behavior. That was a wake-up call, so I stopped and started to reorganize my life, planning to get back into medical school. 
About a month after I was served with the restraining order, an ex-fiancé from my past, the one I had dumped for my ex-fiancé, called me out of the blue. She wanted to talk about the news that my ex-fiancé was getting married to another man, which she had seen on social media. I wasn't really into any form of social media, so I wasn't aware of it. Her call seemed more like an opportunity to gloat because I had dumped her for my now ex-fiancé. She was still upset about being dumped even though she was now married with kids. She told me that I was a loser for leaving her and warned me that my ex-fiancé was going to ruin my life. She seemed glad that karma had caught up with me, and she hung up on me before I could apologize. I've been trying to move on from my ex-fiancé, and this news has stirred up those feelings all over again. It was just the beginning because it wasn't just my ex-girlfriend who called me. Several mutual friends and people I had lost touch with reached out to express their surprise about us not being together anymore. I even started blocking people's numbers because I knew what they were going to talk about. It was incredibly embarrassing. Out of curiosity, I decided to download the app Instagram, which she was really into when we were together, and she spent a lot of time there. It seemed like he spent a lot of time on it as well because I noticed he had posted thousands of pictures. From what I could see, in the two months they had known each other, they had traveled together twice. I also found pictures of them together from a year ago, which means they had been dating for over a year while we were engaged. She used to take pictures with me and post them on Instagram. About a year ago, she stopped doing that, and at the time, I didn't think much of it. Now I understand why she stopped. I noticed that she had deleted all the pictures that included me and even edited me out of some photos. She had removed me from her life a long time ago, while I continued to support her financially. It's hard to understand how she could be so cold. As I scrolled through her Instagram, it became clear that while we were engaged, she was still seeking attention from other men. During those times, her photos became more revealing, and she started posting more suggestive pictures. I failed to notice any of it. Perhaps if I had Instagram back then, I might have sensed that something was amiss. Her profile was public, so I decided to follow her on Instagram using a fake name and profile picture. This soon turned into a kind of obsession because I started closely monitoring everything she did online. However, it all came to a halt when she posted one day that she was five months pregnant. This was odd because she had left me just two months ago. Five months ago, she was my fiancé, and we were still close, although not as much. I realized she must have loved with both me and the doctor, leaving me wondering who was the real father of the child. He had no clue about our past relationship, he probably thought I was just some guy fixated on his new wife. I considered the possibility that the baby might be mine. However, she claimed she had been on birth control, which made me wonder if she had stopped taking it and was involved with both of us. Update, after learning about my ex-fiancé's pregnancy, which was now five months along, I realized there was a good chance I could be the father. Financially, I wasn't prepared to support a child. Furthermore, given how my ex had been treating me recently, she probably wouldn't want me anywhere near the child or willing to co-parent with me. It seemed like she was deceiving the doctor by not telling him the truth, that I was her ex-fiancé of seven years. However, I didn't feel sorry for him. That was his responsibility to find out. Besides, I was still upset that he had encouraged her to get a restraining order against me without even knowing the full story. I was aware that the truth would eventually come out, and I would be there to witness it all unfold. So, I made a decision to turn the page and refocus my efforts on getting my life back on track. I filled my days with work and began hitting the gym, carefully managing my calorie intake and practicing intermittent fasting. Within a few weeks, I started shedding the excess weight. Additionally, I joined spiritual support groups that emphasized yoga and meditation, providing me the opportunity to meet insightful and spiritual women. During this time, I faced challenges in the dating department. I hadn't dated for over seven years because my ex-fiancé had been my only partner during that time. However, I lacked the motivation to date, often using the excuse that I was dedicated to my goals and deeply engrossed in preparing for my medical entrance exam. The medical school I aimed to attend was conveniently located in the same city where I currently resided. I managed to shed around 40 pounds in just two months. People who had seen me a few months earlier wouldn't have recognized me. My focus was on maintaining a clean and healthy diet, regular visits to the gym, and keeping to myself most of the time. I made a conscious effort to distance myself from our mutual friends by changing my phone number and cutting ties. I wanted a fresh start. Fast forward five months later, I successfully passed my medical entrance exam and secured admission to a medical school. My goal was to complete medical school in three years or less and then embark on about five years of residency to fulfill my dream of becoming a surgeon. Jumping ahead two years into medical school, which typically spans four years, but I'd been taking on extra credit hours and tackling prerequisites, life had become incredibly dull. My daily routine consisted of attending classes and tutoring for extra income, as I was essentially a financially struggling medical student. It had been a full two years since my last relationship with my ex, so I decided it was time to start casually dating again, though I was unsure where to begin. For the past nine years, my dating life was limited to my ex-fiancé and people I met through everyday activities. I ventured into online dating, particularly Tinder, but found it frustrating. 
Most matches didn't lead to meaningful connections, and many people seemed fake or misrepresented themselves. After seven months, I deleted the app with limited success. Moreover, I struggled with approach anxiety and awkwardness, something many men can relate to. I explored the bar scene but didn't achieve the desired success. So, I turned to online resources, like YouTube videos on motivation and self-improvement. That's how I discovered The Way of the Superior Man by David Data, a book covering various life aspects for men. It helped me understand the differences between masculine and feminine behaviors. Another useful book was The Red Queen by Matt Ridley, exploring mate selection and attractiveness. I learned a lot from these resources but new practical experience was vital. I committed to approaching attractive women for an hour each day, initially struggling with approach anxiety. However, I learned about the flow state and the importance of building momentum, which drastically improved my results. I frequented two different grocery stores within an hour and managed to secure at least one solid phone number from attractive girls. So, in 21 days, I secured 15 phone numbers, went on dates with 11 women, and 5 became regular friends with benefits. After around 3 months, I took a brief break from going out and approaching women. Managing the numerous text messages and dates had become quite stressful. I had so many attractive women and dates at that time that I was the one cancelling on them. I began to feel like a male version of a sought-after woman. At a certain point, I decided to put a halt to it all because I was having love with too many different women, and it was starting to feel unhealthy. At my peak, I was simultaneously seeing nine different women. I didn't bother to call or text them frequently, instead, they were the ones reaching out and requesting time with me. I was in a state of abundance, and it's challenging to put into words, but I can only imagine it's somewhat akin to the life of a rock star or perhaps an athlete. I didn't let this affect my studies because I had a structured daily routine that included going out, studying, working, attending school, dating, and having closeness. Any woman who didn't align with my schedule was someone I would part ways with. At this point, I still went out for an hour not because I wanted more women, but because I was obsessed with the rush of endorphins I experienced when facing my fears. One day, while I was at a grocery store doing my usual one-hour approaches, I spotted a woman with two kids. She was pushing them in a shopping cart, and she seemed familiar. I thought she resembled my ex fiance so I followed her briefly and called her by her name. She turned around, looking surprised to see me, and approached me. She even gave me a light hug, which caught me off guard. After breaking the embrace, she mentioned that she recognized my voice but not me. It had been more than two and a half years since she served me with a restraining order, and it felt like a lifetime ago. She explained that she had been trying to reach out to me but couldn't find my contact information, so she eventually gave up. I questioned why she would want to contact someone she had previously taken legal action against, and she apologized, expressing regret for how things had ended between us. We discussed how she was doing, and she mentioned that she was doing well. I couldn't help but notice that she didn't appear as beautiful as I had once believed. I had used to think of her as the most beautiful woman I had ever seen, but in that moment, she seemed average, and she had gained some weight. It was hard to believe that I had spent so much time following her and being upset over our breakup when she no longer matched the type of women I was currently involved with in terms of looks. She must have sensed my indifference, and she appeared nervous, asking me various questions. After about five minutes of conversation, I attempted to say goodbye and leave, but she seemed reluctant to let go of the conversation. I mentioned that I was running late and needed to leave, but she requested my phone number and suggested we have coffee sometime. I didn't really want anything to do with her, but at the same time, I couldn't shake the thought that the two-year-old girl might be my daughter. Despite not wanting to see my ex fiance again, I still wanted a chance to potentially find out if the two-year-old was indeed my child, preferably through a paternity test without her knowledge. We exchanged numbers and arranged to meet. Fast forward about three days later, I texted her to confirm our meetup. I hoped she would bring the kids with her, so I planned to meet at a family picnic spot. She was already there when I arrived, attempting to hug me, though I didn't respond warmly. She sat down with an awkward expression. I doubt she had informed her husband that she was meeting up with the guy she had filed a restraining order against over two years ago. I sat down too, and she began apologizing to me. She apologized for breaking up with me via text message, getting a restraining order, and not keeping her promise to support me after years of my support. She also mentioned that she noticed a change in my energy, seeing me as more assertive and in control. I asked her about her work, and she said she was employed at a hospital across town. I tried to avoid bringing up anything about our past relationship entirely. Whenever she circled back to it, I wanted her to know that I had moved on. Most of my questions were focused on the kids. I complimented her on how cute they were and asked if she'd be willing to bring them to a water park the next day so I could meet them again. She mentioned she wouldn't have time the following day due to work but suggested we plan for the day after. Throughout our conversation, she was clearly flirting with me, attempting to seduce me, but it didn't have any effect. I've learned quite a bit about social dynamics in recent months, understanding the importance of maintaining my composure. Her flirtations were a way to search for any weaknesses in me, but I remained unfazed by her advances. The more I held my ground, the more she seemed to become submissive and attracted to me. 
I was already quite busy and couldn't afford to spend time at a water park, but it was crucial for me to find out if the baby was indeed mine. When the day arrived, she cancelled, explaining that her youngest daughter wasn't feeling well. We rescheduled for the following week. I had initially ordered a swab collection kit but abandoned the idea last minute because I didn't think I'd have an opportunity to use it without my ex-fiancé noticing. I consulted a friend who's a genetic technologist, and we brainstormed ways to collect DNA samples before the meeting. Since it was summertime and hot, we thought there might be an ice cream or smoothie bar nearby, where I could discreetly collect a DNA sample using a straw or cup. I arrived early at the water park. It took them a while to arrive, but when they did, I carried the two-year-old while my ex pushed the one-year-old in a stroller. I suggested getting some smoothies for the kids due to the hot weather. The atmosphere was friendly and light, and she was very amicable toward me. Anyone who saw us would have assumed we were a couple. We discussed a wide range of topics, even joking about them catching me sleeping in my car. She asked if I was in a relationship, and I replied affirmatively. When she inquired if it was a serious one, I also confirmed it was. She shared that her relationship with her husband wasn't as perfect as she had hoped and that they were presently separated, working on reconciling. I didn't delve into the details or reasons behind their separation. My focus was on positivity, and I wished her the best. My attention was on the two-year-old, waiting for an opportunity to collect the straw after she finished with it, hoping there would be enough genetic material on it. Despite the day's events, I hadn't forgiven her for how she had treated me. I recognized that she was still the same person, although I also acknowledged that I had created the opportunity for her to take advantage of me. After our conversation at the water park, I sensed that things weren't going smoothly in her marriage, and she might be considering leaving. However, her husband seemed to be her best option at the moment, so she was sticking with him. Something must have happened for them to separate, but I didn't bother to inquire or care. In the end, I managed to collect the straw, and it appeared there was enough saliva on it. Following our time at the park, I called my friend, the genetic technologist I had previously consulted. Since we had discussed this beforehand, he wanted me to bring the sample to his lab as soon as possible. The next day, he tested the DNA sample, matching it with mine, and it turned out that she was indeed my daughter. I wasn't entirely sure about my next steps. I could expose my ex by sharing the DNA results with her husband, jeopardizing their chances of reconciliation, but that might lead to her coming after me, and I wasn't in a position to co-parent at the moment. So, I believed the best thing for my daughter was to be raised in a stable home. My residency would begin in less than a year, which would provide me with some income, not a lot, but enough. After completing my residency in five years, I would reassess the situation and stay in contact with my ex to see my daughter whenever she allowed it. 